So about uh, four months ago, Jack comes in my office. He said, uh, I've always had this dream. I'm like, okay, I'm not sure I want to know about it, but you give it to me anyway. He says, I always wanted to do a 3D lecture. I'm like, that's a great idea. So we ran with it, and uh, Monica and everybody from Arjun sent us an email yesterday afternoon. Can we have the 3D video so we can test it and make sure? And we were about halfway through cutting that video. So as you know, as dental technicians, we always push it to the back end. So we're slightly nervous that this is going to work. So it's either going to be the most epic 3D event ever, or we're just going to do it in 2D. So we have the backups as well. So, and I want to make clear, we're not going to do the whole thing in 3D, because then we're going to need airplane bags, and everybody's going to be uncomfortable. So we just shot a little video, talk about zirconia, and then we're going to make it serious. I think what we said was, you know, it's Saturday. We've been in lectures since Monday. Yeah. We're bored, so we're not going to bore you. So hopefully it'll be entertaining, but also very uh, educational. We're going to make it fun. You ready to go? Yeah, you can go. No, you can go. You see, we do these things completely <laughs> unscripted. Everybody always says, do you guys script this? I'm like, Phew. no, we don't have time what to script What was prep it, like? You're looking it. at prep right now. <laughs> So, uh, so you'll see throughout this. The, I'm going to uh, kind of go remote. Th throughout the event, you would see Jack look back at the screen before he says what's going on. It's because he's <laughs> never seen this presentation. Uh, so just bear with him. We're uh, from Absolute Dental Lab. We've been in business 25 years. Um, my business partner, myself, has been here from '99, and uh, we went through the good old American dream. Literally, got you with the box in a suitcase. We were 28 years old, 29 years old, and. Uh, joined up with some of the best in the industry of an exceptional team. And 20 years later, you know, we won the NADL Lab of the Year Award, which is a huge humbling experience for us uh, to be recognized for you know, the stuff we do, giving back to the community, and not just you know, Crown and Bridge. Right. And then Jack joined us two years ago, and that really put us on the right path. You know, we have got Yansu Kim here, master ceramist with cobalt chrome, can create the most beautiful layered ceramics. Jack joins us, he's like, what? What's these brushes doing on your benches here? We shouldn't be layering ceramics anymore. I'm like, no, we don't do zirconia. Zirconia is terrible. So it's been a, a big evolution for us. And uh, you know, digital dentures today, the industry is moving so fast that anything we say on the stage today is going to be obsolete six months from now. So it's a very exciting time for us mm. to, to live in. So just to kind of give you a rundown of what we're going to try to do today is you know, we can talk about hybrids and sit here and show hybrids on hybrids on hybrids, but it's more than hybrids. It's the whole workflow. It's the business aspect behind hybrids. Not just hybrids. I mean, that's what we're going to talk about today. And my part of the business is more the guided workflow aspect. So I want to show you that and what we're working on to also help the industry capture the surgeons on the front end and drive the pros back on the back end. And then uh, Jack will talk a little bit about the pros, how we process that and the yeah. digital workflow. Well, and the surgical aspect of it was something that was new to me when I got there. It's, it's Conrad and the surgical team's baby at Absolute. And it was really remarkable to see the results and the accuracy that they were achieving. And my, my you know, being myself, I'm a, a full arch or full mouth uh, rehabilitation guy. And, you know, how many times are you getting into those really, really ugly, ugly situations where things were not planned out? And then when you accept the case, because we accept the case. Now the onus is on us to figure out what we're going to do with that mess. When I seen what the guys were doing, uh, it, was, it was truly remarkable. And we're going to walk through not only from the surgical phase, all the way through how we're going to take that data and those incredible results that they achieved and transfer that into our final restoration. So I think you know, what we discussed the other day in one of the other meetings was the name of the game in the industry right now is prototyping and digital workflow. So the less we have to come out of the digital workflow, the more predictable these cases are. We got a case a couple of weeks ago, upper lower full rehab on 10 implants, five and five. In abutment level impressions, prescription said? A2, go to final. <laughs> no bites. That is, that no is bite absolutely 100% true. It's, it's crazy. So I said, Jack, I think you need to take this phone call because it's going to be an interesting one. So he calls and the doctor goes, so, oh, okay, we need to do bites, video, tooth triants. Well, it's a good place to start with these cases. I said, well, we can just hand mount it for you if you like. Not going to be so accurate, but tongue in cheek. So Jack says, uh, 
The doctor says, oh, okay, I got it. But I need it in 10 days because I promised the patient the final delivery in 10 days because they're going on a cruise. The problem with that is it's just not planning. A technician or us technicians, the restorer of team comes in on the back end and all of a sudden we're holding the bag of beans and we got to save the case. Yeah. So the more we can drive this from the front end. And really educate your clinicians. I mean, it's really important because a lot of them, I mean, there's some great operators out there. We all know that. Uh, but then a lot of them don't know. For example, I mean, there's, there's two PVS impressions and go to final. It's, and, and it sounds crazy, but believe it or not, it's not unheard of. You guys have seen it probably in your own labs today, so. And then we'll switch it up a little bit. Last year when we showed a digital workflow on how to capture the data. And this year we said, you know, not everybody has an oral scanner, not everybody's comfortable in digital yet. So we have a little bit of a more analog workflow to capture data so we don't have to go to bite rooms. You know, and that, I'm always amazed. I'm speaking on digital dentures, printed dentures with the Lucitone material. It's exceptional material. And I still stand on stage and I pinch myself. I'm like, I don't know anything about dentures. And that's the great place where we are. Our artists now are creating the final part. Remember the days we had a brush and we had to layer the entire case, Yansu? Now we get the case layered and we just fine tune it. And that's a beautiful place to yeah. be. And then Jack's going to show you his magic. Well, it's the transfer of that data. Conrad mentioned prototyping. And you should all know when prototyping and provisionals and PMMAs, they've all been out for a while since kind of the very onset of digital. But really think about the power of that and what it's done from the industry because I've come from the old school of doing this and we were just talking about this earlier. Um, you would lose, every time you did a try-in and you would go forward, you would lose that information going through but you were always trying to keep up with it and match it. The prototyping is probably one of the single best things that happened to us in capturing that data and transferring it throughout the case is very, very important. And you know, then obviously materials is where it all came together. If right. you think five years ago, we had most of the workflows, but we didn't have the material to back it up. You know, we've been printing dentures for what, two, three years? The problem was it wasn't actually dentures. It was something closely resembling a denture. And now that we're seeing these polymers being developed and we see the technology that comes out of these milling units, yeah. you know, that's what's so much fun working with Arjun because he just tells Jeff it's not good enough. We have demarcation, this is what we need, and these guys listen. So we're gonna show you two cases today that actually does not exist. <laughs> they didn't even know we were gonna do these cases. It's with a brand new material that does not exist. Paul Cascone is here somewhere, and he's gonna still design it. But it's a very exciting time to show this. So we'll talk a little bit about transitions. Yeah, so this is what we're gonna kinda of talk about today. When we get to the final restoration, and this is gonna be um, or an early on version or prototype of uh, the new, what would be the new HTML zirconia from Oregon. And it's gonna be a straight 1250 4Y all the way through from the bottom to the top. That's very important. And we're gonna, we're gonna talk about why and why I stress that. And you can see this is an early on version but if we look at the teeth, you can already see the gradient. And when I'm talking to the guys and what they do, and Jeff and Paul are absolutely incredible, um, they'll go back and forth and I'll give them feedback and they're gonna go ahead and they're gonna adjust and they're gonna talk their language amongst each other and then they're going to create a new recipe and they're gonna press a puck. It's gonna be one and um, then I'm gonna get it and hopefully it comes directly to me instead of going into the general workflow, uh, but it does. And then I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna cut it and I'm gonna center it and I'm gonna look at it and then I'm gonna call Jeff back up. And the goal is, is, is constantly trying to push to get to that perfect, absolute perfect shade and gradient and in size ledge with the material and that's what we're working on. And I gotta tell you, behind the scenes with, with Paul and Jeff, uh, what they're able to create is absolutely remarkable. So I'm kind of putting them on the spot right now uh, <laughs> talking about the, the material that exists but does not exist. Uh, but I believe it's, it's on, it, it, on its way shortly. And they're looking at kind of uh, shortly, and I'm, I'm, again, I'm going to put them on the spot. No pressure. None at all. And shortly put, after Lab Day West. <laughs> I'll put you on the spot a little bit. You'll probably see that Jack looks a little uncomfortable. He looks like he's caged. Mm -hmm. Jack can't stand still. He's got some form of ADD. And, and I'm stuck on the box right now. So, so <laughs> it's uh, very, I'm going, I'm going remote. Oh uh, yeah. So here. this is what I'm happens. Going mobile. So at Lab Day <laughs> I West, couldn't take it anymore. At Lab Day West, he was up and down the aisles, and uh, three wallets got <laughs> lost <laughs> in the aisle. So if you're sitting Freaking in the aisle and he comes by, you know, we say just keep things a little bit closer to you. So ah, without further now. ado, 
Now, we want to show you the history of zirconia. And we thought, you know, it's kind of a boring subject. So let's Is see everybody if, ready? See if we can make this a little bit more uh, all right, wait, exciting. Hold on. Let me see. So okay, we'll, you got, uh, we'll dim what the you lights. What do you got for me back there? I got I'll some, put on mine. I got some popcorn for you. You got yours on? Uh, I got my glasses here somewhere. Zirconia. What is it? Where does it come from? And, uh, John, I think this is the wrong video. Welcome to Zirconia. What is it? Where does it come from? And why do we care? Featuring Conrad Rinsberg and Jack Morano. <laughs> Jack, wear a mask. You don't have one on either. And I've been cutting on an empty puck for the last 15 minutes. Because that's the only thing I'll give you to work on. That's probably safer that safer way. Safer that way. You know what? We've been working on zirconia, unlike this, for the longest time. We really don't know much about it. No, nope, nothing. Maybe we should Google. Ah, let's check it out. Ah. How do you spell zirconia again? Z. I, I got it. Oh. Ah, whoa. That's some interesting results. Yeah, there's some guys mining. Let's get back to the show. I learned how to finger type back in the 80s. This is awesome. You're welcome. Whoa, look at those results. Jans and Frederick. I came as quick as I could. Hey, Frederick. I heard you discovered something pretty cool. I'm working on the mineral zircon. Let me write this down for posterity purposes. What are we going to do with zircon? Oh, well, I'm trying to isolate it. What do you think? How about my teeth with it? I like that. That's a great idea. Oh, I think I'll write this down. Let me see what happens when I mix this with that. Mm, nothing. Absolutely nothing. No. What do you think about this? I don't think you need to mix yellow and blue. Mm. Mm. Yon, radio. Let's drink to your discovery. Okay, bloody chap. Wow. wow. Let's get back to the show. You know what, Jack? Now that we've made a big mess here at the lab and we know so much more about Zirconia, mm. I wonder how Arjun processes it to give us these wonderful products. Hmm, interesting. Maybe we should go there. I don't like to fly. I wonder if we can fly there in our minds like back in the 70s. Ooh, that'll be fun. Let me say, as a side note, that I am currently wearing You Are The Next Master Badge. Where did you get that from? I stole it from Dries. See? I am the next master. Dries, he stole your button again. Dries is not here today. That's why I'm wearing it. Now, let's watch a video from our sponsors. Welcome to Oregon.
Let's get back to the show. Hey, Conrad. Hey, look, just came in the mail. Whoa, Jack will be so excited. It's the new Argent HD Plus. Now for the magic. We hope you enjoyed our video as much as we enjoyed making it. <laughs> yeah, you enjoyed it. <laughs> Thanks for watching the show. All right, what'd you guys think? Woo, it ran. Can't believe it worked. Woo, I can't believe that worked. So, uh, I just want to get things back up and running, yeah. Mm, I'm saving my glasses. So I hope that was helpful. Uh, we had so much fun shooting it. it. Took us about three days we didn't have to get all that footage together and then uh, ended up being six minutes. So I know how the movie stars feel now. So I'll have Jack start a little bit on the, the art of shade matching and talking about layering. Do we really need to still layer? All right. Anyway, the, you know, that discussion is still being had. Um, you know, and unfortunately, and, and I traditionally would always, and from a manufacturing research and development kind of standpoint, and the technician that I was, when there would be a material or a product and they would tell you or you would hear it's not for the anterior, the first thing I would do is, I would do whatever I want to do. First thing I'd do is put it in the anterior. And I'd take a picture of it and I'd show them and say, hey, look at here it is in the anterior. Uh, we're looking at multi-layer zirconias now, and when, we have two zirconias in the laboratory. We're going to have our general, um, you know, single unit, three unit bridge, high aesthetic zirconia, that's going to be the STML, the multi-layered zirconia. And, you know, we still, you know, hear the question um, come up about layering. We still hear the question come up about Emacs. And, and personally, I don't think you need either anymore. Uh, there's no way that you can't get really any restoration now with the multi-layer zirconia. And the multi-layer zirconia, if you ask me, is actually more aesthetic. Argens is than Emacs itself. And we had this discussion in the beginning, you know, if a clinician subscribes a layered anterior crown, no. and we use a SDML, is that still a layered crown? Sure and is. Yes, it is. It's just Anton layered. Anton and Jeff layered. It, so. <laughs> But the true magic comes in that we can now achieve the same results, if not better, yeah. and especially in tough cases like this. Well, and here's an interesting situation, and I was talking with Dr. Mark Ludlow about this. Um, zirconia has progressed, and you've all been there since the beginning. I've been there since the beginning with you. And, you know, early on it was so ugly that there was courses here at LMT showing how to layer copings. We've talked about this before uh, from the masters because uh, it was so bad and then you know it kept transitioning over the years and the advancements are incredible one of the properties that zirconia held that was actually good was its ability to mask out underlying either dark stumps or custom abutments so interestingly enough if you're watching if you've seen this come up in your laboratory although we got incredible aesthetics and incredible strength we've lost that ability all right, so I'm going to show you also when you're working with the material how to go ahead and guard against that and still, still get world class aesthetics without the need to layer. Okay? Very, very, lots of translucencies, lots of things going on in these teeth, lots of characterization. We're going to use, of course, the STML. And green stage finishing, we talked about this yesterday. In a eight and nine, I'll do some. In a seven through 10, I'm definitely doing it. On a six through 11, you can guarantee I'm doing it. 
Um, it's very, very, very important, I believe, to uh, go ahead and, and put that surface texture and anatomy in now. This is be the application of white plus, uh, the IDS CAD material, which is going to block out that dark stump for us. And um, it's really remarkable. The first time I ever heard anybody using it, it was my younger brother, and he says, it's great, I'm opaquing zirconia. And I said, that's the stupidest thing I've ever heard of in my life. Why the hell would you do that? Ah, now I use it constantly. So uh, it really, really does help out. And you can see that you know we were able, that's, that's monolithic, 100% monolithic. It is not layered. It is just stain and glaze. This is Dr. Mark Ludlow. Those are his provisionals. He did an exceptional job on. Again, underneath that eight and nine are two custom abutments. This was a smile and a day case he did. It basically it comes in everything in a box from the abutments to the implants to the drills uh, to the provisionals. And then he was able to get these restorations. It's monolithic. It's 100% monolithic. So do we really need the, the, to layer today? I would say no. I, I think we're past that. When you use a good quality zirconia, and I also want to stress that because not all zirconias are created equal and zirconias are formulated powders. You've seen the inside of Arjun, uh, which, is, which is a remarkable place. I've had the honor to be there several times and it's absolutely incredible, but, but more importantly to me is how much uh, Anton and Jeff and Paul and all the other Richard and all the other uh, team members in Argon really, really care about technicians in the laboratory. That being said, they only use the highest quality materials in their formulations for their zirconia. That being Toso powders, which as we all know, is considered the best there is. Um, so when you're looking at it, you know, use, the use of a high quality multi-layer zirconia, really, I don't think that there's anything out there that's not achievable. At least I haven't seen it sure. yet. And if we take a step back and we look where we start controlling the process, it's definitely at the surgical stage. But I think a lot of speakers talk about the surgery, surgeons say, I don't want to do guided, I don't need guided, because I can place implants in a edentulous patient just as accurately by hand as I can guided. And I always say, yes, you can, and you can't, but it's a hard sell for a surgeon to be told you have to guide. The value for a surgeon to be told, let's guide the case, is a guided workflow, because that drives the restoratives back to them prescribing more of these cases. So the value for a lab, and this is what we found, to start the process with a diagnostic wax up. So I always say it's not about guided surgery. It's about a guided diagnostic conversion. Because that gives us a starting point that we can build the final case. So if we look at what this is, if I can get rid of one word in, the, in our industry, it's guided surgery. We went from free handing to guided everything to guided nothing, and now we're somewhere back in the middle, which is a good place to be. But we have to show the value in guided conversions or guided workflows. And that's what I want to show you today. So last year we were on the stage. And our system that we came up with and filed a few patents on, the first thing we wanted to do was make sure that we can see the base guide accurately. So the idea with a guided workflow is if we have a video in a dentate patient, as long as we don't lose that video, then we can restore that patient back to the same position they were. If we set the patient in a centric relation, as long as we have a base guide that translates to that position, then we know how we can get back in our conversion. So think about this. I spent hours chair side converting dentures. Have the guy in a chest lock, we had a nose chin position, patient's intubated, you have no idea what the vertical is. And we saw conversions as, ma'am, you're going to have teeth when you wake up. We did not define what kind of teeth she will have when she wakes up. And that used to be a problem, because they were in that for three months. They break the denture. The surgeon gets holding the bag to fix this. He's like, I'm not a restorative guy. The restorative guy goes, I didn't have anything to do with that. You guys deal with it. So if we have these kind of systems, and I'll, I'm not going to get into this too much, and I'll show you why there's such a value and what we're trying to do with this. Now we can do a latch conversion without having to hold that patient back. Everything is based off the base guides. So the original Synergy, as you saw them, had two small buckle reflections. Instead of laying a full buckle flap, not to even mention a full buckle and lingual flap, and then trying to seat that guide, which is basically impossible. So we were very proud of ourselves. We were like, that's a great idea. And I speak to a periodontist, and he's like, I don't like to make 
facial reflections on the lower. The mandible has different blood flow. You're going to get necrosis. You're going to get issues with, and I'll show you why we come up with that. But let me show you where this system works. And I'll, I'll close the loop because you're probably wondering why I'm telling you this. And there's a really good reason. The difference with our synergy system is we bring everything back to the bench. A lot of these systems are full digital. This is probably the only time where there's a huge value for a lab to actually build the case on an articulator and double check that everything is where it needs to be. There's a lot of digital jumps between diagnostic software, building the guides, and then placing everything together. So we bring it out. That's an older case, but look at the base guide. So we have a full upper lower arch. A full upper lower conversion is more predictable than a single arch because we're destroying everything and then building everything back up. So look at what we have. We have the vertical set. Now we know we can take all the teeth out at the same time. That's true sequential guidance. We don't have to do the upper first and then convert and then switch back and do the lower into the upper. We'll take everything out and we'll segment. We'll segment on the model the same as we do in the mouth. And I always look at this picture and, I, and I'm doing consultations with the patients. And for some reason, the patient always relates more to the technician than the guy that's going to cut their teeth out the next day. So they always look at me and go, is this going to hurt? <laughs> and I'm like, have you seen the movie Saw? It's kind of like that and probably not going to. The value in this segmentation is we can actually mount the post-operative models in CR or in CO, depending on where the surgeon wants to set it. So now we have everything ready to go ahead and do our surgery. That surgery is done on this model exactly the same way. So now we know we're controlling the process for our surgeon. If we're going to be chair side for the first few cases, we want to make sure that everything is flowing. Now look at the conversion. And I missed this for almost five or six years doing conversions. This is an hour and maybe 45 minutes into the surgery. We extracted all the teeth, placed the guides, and we latched our dentures. See, it's just a little latch system that puts our PMA in place. So we take the patient, sedated obviously, and close him back into centric occlusion. Went straight back, no complaints. Didn't even think about it. We go through the whole surgery, and this is about hour three and a half, hour four, and I just take the patient and push him, push him back, and that's the best occlusion we could get. So I'm looking at this and the surgeon goes, get the burr. I'm going to take a bite, you're going to go cut everything away, I'm going to finish, we're going to put it in. We've done that for years. We're done with the conversion and the patient's like, and then what do we do? We grind in a raw surgical site, we set the CO, but what happens is the joint shifts during surgery because we've got this patient dragging open. And what happens is now that joint is overseeded. So the rotational position has changed and the teeth can include in the same position. So I said to the surgeon, guess what? I have a theory, if those base guides didn't change or loosen or come out, and we had good occlusion there, and this is what happens three hours later, if we leave this patient for 24 hours, we're gonna get that to occlude again. Next day, patient came back, and we had good occlusion. So it shows us the value in having an accurate conversion not playing prosthodontist with our surgeons because that's not why they became surgeons. And we're asking our surgeons to take pre-op bites and conversion bites and do this with that. And that's where the system is helping us. After the second surgery, these surgeons do the whole case themselves. Send the system back, they cut the latches, they're done with the conversion. No more acrylic into raw sites, picking up sutures and all those things. Everything is done before we suture up. So I start talking to my period guys and they're like, we don't like to lay those, those flaps on the facial. So we file for patent on these, we call them TDIs, tissue depth indicators. So we'll run the DICOM data, we'll run the models, and we'll measure the tissue depth. So I said to myself, if we don't have large bone reflection or bone reduction, we don't need or require it, then we don't need to lay that facial flap. We don't need to lay a lingual flap either. So if we can see it over the tissue without tissue necrosis, then we're at a good place. The toughest part of any guided solution today is seating the base guide. The reason for that is if you don't lay a clean flap, you can't seat the base guide, the occlusion is off, and it's a five-hour surgery. So we filed for this and we said, well, it sounds like a pretty good idea. Now, what happens now is when we seat the base guide, we can't seat it as a 
cross-arch stabilized unit, and that's what we want to try. So we have a little tooth aligner with two latch conversions or two hinges on it, and we can now seat these two individual pieces to engage through the tissue into the bone, just with these four or five. The value of something like this is dual verification. If we can verify on a tooth position and a bone position, we basically put everything in undercut, we drill fixation, and it's easy. Once we have everything mounted, now you see we have our fixations there. To get across from cross mount or cross arch stabilizing it, Brian actually came up with a bridge pin that latches everything back together. So now we cross arch stabilizing, we're ready to go, we do the extractions, and now we can do scallop guides. And we can effectively do scallop guides. So Jack's one of the big Mio guys, and I hate to tell Jack this, but I'm working hard to reduce the amount of pink that we have to apply because it's big structures. So the days of us going in and looking at a high smile and saying, ah, oh, we're cutting 15 millimeters of bone, which we don't need to cut, but we're trying to get out of the aesthetic zone when the patient smiles, now we can actually say, how will we do a good planned diagnostic and then place the tooth positions back in. Show you the, the MUAs, once you place your abutments, we have a little abutment liner and these systems are all kind of the same from that point on. It just shows you where to line up your screwdriver, you line up your 30 degree or your 16 degree, so it's, or your 15 degree, sorry, 17 degree. Um, and then we know everything is ready to go. So why we do this in the lab is we want to do the conversion part on the bench. Because we want to see which of these temp components will draw at the same time. So we'll send the surgeon a note and say, place coping in 3, 6, and 12 first. Slide it over, pick it up, remove it. Place the other two or three copings, slide it back over, pick it up. A conversion cannot be easier than that because now it's been bench tested and ready to go. Then we go to the back, the latches are cut, we slide this over and the patient goes home. So it's extremely simple and very predictable for us to get back to where the occlusion was set. And that's kind of where we are in the industry right now. Getting away from tooth try-in, after tooth try-in. And what we've noticed, and Chris Love, our removals manager, will agree with this, we do a tooth setup. Younger clinicians uses the tooth setup as a bite room because it's much easier to move the teeth around and have a better idea of where you are. That's 45 minutes to reset the case. So once we eradicate that need, we're much more efficient. Now think about where we are with the surgical solutions today. We're basically asking our restorative clinicians to do denture application. It's basically making a denture. The first step in doing a hybrid is a bite room, tooth try-in, and then we copy that in the system. So once we get to this, we don't have to worry about bite rooms. We don't have to get into a VDO question. So I called a bunch of my clinicians. We were obviously a traditional crown and bridge lab, and I said, how do you feel about denture work? Seven out of 10 people I spoke to do not prescribe edentulous patients anymore. So there's not enough money in it for me to deal with five or six trines that I can't predict. That's the problem for surgeons. Most restorative guys who are not well versed with this or not comfortable with this will not prescribe it. If us as lab technicians can go in and say, we have the solution, we can help you drive more business, they'll help us drive more business back to us. Now we become a resource to these clinicians. So the idea for me with this is that in the industry right now, there's no real solution for dental labs. If you're not one of the big companies that have the resources to you know, have all these, these uh, systems. So we wrote a software that will enable labs to do the case from start to finish themselves. That's the idea with this system. You do the diagnostic wax up, you talk to the restorative, you talk to the surgeon, and you facilitate the process. Now there's different levels of this and I'll show you, but let me show you the surgery real quick. That's the seating guide. If we look at the tooth indentations through our guide, if that seats, you don't have to be chair side to do the conversion. The conversion then is cutting the latches and the patient goes home because we've indexed the vertical position of that occlusal table. And from there on, we take everything out, we put the implants in, we get them to the right rotation, put the MEAs on, loot them and cut the latches. It's just that simple. For the longest time, it's been so overcomplicated. Surgical bites, bites into this, 
dentures with that. Cut the flanges, don't cut the flanges. So we're trying to keep it simple. Look at this, almost no bleeding on that patient. Did all the extractions. Unfortunately, we didn't need bone reduction here. It would have been a really nice case to show. Everything was good. They wanted to place a crown and bridge structure back into those shaped pontics. So now we were able to do our conversion PMMA in true crown and bridge style. So think about this. Every time I speak at a study club and it's a periodontist, I'm very careful to talk about upper hybrids. As soon as you say upper hybrid, they go, I don't describe those anymore because they're overlapping the ridge. People are losing implants. Periimplantitis is caused by this. And I always think to myself, I never say this, it's because the surgical site is not prepared to receive an upper hybrid. Once we can get the bone or the sockets where it needs to be, there's no need for overlapping. You have to butt the hybrid. Mm. Jack and I had this conversation in the beginning. We cannot overlap anymore. You cannot overlap an upper hybrid. So if the bone looks like that, how do you join that junction? That's why it's so important to be involved on the front end and make this so much more predictable. Same guide that said you go to direction, we go to depth through the guide, you can do any implant system with this, as long as you have a fully guided solution. You have to deliver the implant through the guide. So one of the first surgeries I did with one of my uh, guys in town, we extract all the patient's teeth to all the bone reductions, and I said to Aaron, I'm gonna be three hours at most. Hour six, the surgeon looks at me and says, uh, hand me the keys. And I'm like, uh, you talk about the guided keys? He said, yeah, aren't you supposed to supply those? So we found out after all the extractions were done that we couldn't guide the case. So we freehanded it, blew two buckle plates, lost three implants in the process, and had to start all over. Now, as long as we, we have to be careful, you've got to talk the lingo. Do you have a fully guided kit? A surgical kit's not a fully guided kit. So I will warn you, and we're gonna start a process to train technicians how to ask the right questions, how to document everything. Every phone call is recorded. Everything is signed off by email because there's huge liabilities. This is not fun and games. I will tell you though, this is not hard. Brian is one of our best, him and Matt. Brian started with us two years ago. He knows how to plan these cases. Marker for Raymond. How do you marker for Raymond? You put little dots around the the tube and you make sure you don't mess it. The surgeons are still responsible, but we're facilitating the process. And that makes a big difference. Put our temp components on, we slide our double crossing PMA in there, and everything is looted or latched. At this point, we loot everything together. That's right at surgery stage. That's three days later. He said the patient came in three days later. And you know a patient that's been through this normally looked like Mike Tyson, played around with them for two or three rounds. Said zero, zero blue. Couldn't even imagine this patient had surgery. So now we as lab techs can bring value to this. We can bring value to the surgical. And my idea with our synergy system is to be able to offer it to labs and say, as long as you're well trained, as long as you know what you're doing, and we're going to facilitate hopefully with, with Arjun or something down the line and bring another resource to our customers. Guided surgery, our, our Excuse me, our hybrid business last year was up 32%. Mm. And it's because we're bringing that value from the front end. Since Clear Choice started, Clear Choice budget for their uh, marketing for this year is $150 million. What they're doing is bringing massive amounts of awareness to patients. I have a few surgical friends up in Pennsylvania. He calls me that, he said, I am worried. I'm getting a Clear Choice in town. They've just been approved. I said, don't be worried. You're gonna do five times the business. Because patients go back to the people they trust, not to the people that told them on TV what can be done, and they ask them first. So what the surgeon did was, he made 10 phone calls to 10 of his referrals, spoke to the front office desk, uh, this is so-and-so, I saw a clear choice commercial, do you guys do hybrids, restoratives? Seven people said, assistants said, we don't do hybrids. They lost $250,000 with those seven phone calls. Now think about the resource if we can say, doctor, surgeon, I can help you drive more business. We're chasing the same referrals. We're chasing the restoratives. Surgeons, periodontists have the same deal we do. We gotta get to the pros. And that's a really good place to be with this. So diagnostic design and planning, I'll hurry this up a little bit or we'll get out of my friend Jack's way here. But this is the software 
that we almost done with. And for those of you who's ever been involved with software development, a little latch to design in software is 52,000. A little button is 48,000. So you run into a half a million dollars with something like this very quickly. What we used to do and what most systems still do is they rely on mesh mixer to build these cases. Just to level out and parallel out all the things, Brian, hour and a half, where well, our system is now doing this in half the time. Another big concern, something we have to be very, very careful about. The FDA just regulated all surgical guides as medical devices, which means you can no longer fabricate this without 510K clearance, which means you have to register with the FDA. Now, how much of a problem is this gonna be? It's probably gonna be a problem at some point. So the idea with getting something like this is get the clearance. When you work with it, you're well trained with it, you're covered. You have the system in place, you know how to record it. I was on one of the other systems training seminars and halfway through I, I said, can I ask something? Do you tell the people that starts this system to record every conversation? No, we don't. I said, do they get a full consent that the surgeon is ultimately responsible? No, they don't. And that's a problem. We have to make sure that that doesn't happen. So now we've given Jack a great conversion hybrid, and then I'll let him take it from there. Oh, you're doing a great job. You keep going. No, no, no. Keep going. Sure? My mouth's dry. <laughs> we were in big bar again last night, right. and it's a bad, bad day. I've, I've, I've figured it out. Time stops when you come down the stairs and enter big bar. So what you thought was five minutes was actually four and a half hours, and it's now one in the morning. Uh, so, and there should be a Chicago survival handbook that they give out. What I've seen with um, the system and what I've seen with the surgical guys do, and they're so passionate about it, is the accuracy of the systems. Um, it's truly remarkable. And to give me, the restorative guy, a jumping off point uh, is, is something that's just awesome. The bone reduction is interesting to mention because as when I when I started really getting into gingival ceramics, it was very much a technical specialty, and that's because uh, the restoration itself was a specialty, and they weren't commonplace. Now, like Conrad mentioned, for many reasons, we're seeing this bone reduction. Okay, maybe it's in the transition zone. They're trying to pop above it. Maybe they did extractions and the bone's all shot, so they're trying to get to the good bone. But that's why you're seeing so many of these restorations in your laboratory today with the need for 10, 12 millimeters of gingival ceramic. With the zero, it's really interesting if we can go ahead and eliminate that. What I get from that point from Conrad and the guys is a lot of the diagnostic work has already been done and it's really really good what i want to talk about now with you is guarding kind of not guarding yourself and then teaching your clinicians okay because a lot of times they don't know a lot of times they are not all prosthodontists right and a lot and we'll see these cases a lot of times being restored from the gp practice um, some of them are very good at it some of them are not so much but it's your job to ensure because once you accepted that case, the responsibility is yours. And you have to work with them and you have to walk them through it. I was, for a little bit, I was a little laser pointy envious because I felt strange without it here. Uh, the verification jig, two areas that I see catastrophic failure a lot of times are going to be in verification and bite. And these are very, very common. You want to make sure that they verify. It is so, so important. After the verification, you can go ahead and have them take that surgical conversion. You can index the model at 12, 3, 6, and 9. And uh, go ahead and just make a putty over it. This is a very, very nice workflow. Um, you know, there's a couple of different ways to get from A to Z, but this one really streamlines it. And, and it seems like everybody is kind of capable of doing this if or if not they have a digital scanner. So you go ahead and just make a putty matrix of that surgical conversion on the master cast. Remember, it has to be on the master cast. They cannot take an alginate impression of it in the mouth. And, and there's ways to use it with model matching and that, but it's not 100%. This will be 100% because I'm gonna go ahead and I'm gonna duplicate it. 
Once I get it duplicated, that's going to help me with mounting the case. That's going to help me with you know checking the bite. That's going to help them. They can take a blue moose over it, that same appointment. And that's how I'm going to take it from there and go straight to the prototype stage. I basically just take that putty matrix, fill it with uh, like a bisacryl or a, a, a temp material, and put it back down on the model. What I create with that is actually basically a replica of what the patient's wearing. Now, the quality of this replica, and, and, and that really doesn't matter on there, uh, just all depends on how good their putty is. They really take good putty or, you know, they get pulls in the putty. Um, some of them have come out exceptionally well, and some of them are a little bit funny like in there, but that's completely okay. I have the information I need to start off with. And this will kind of fast forward us to the, the provisional uh, stage. We'll go ahead and, and here, we've gone to setups. Uh, very, very nice. We've gone ahead and tried those in with the patient. She looks very, very happy. And we're gonna go for, and when we're making our provisionals again, um, a lot of this stuff, guys, is still the same stuff that I've been working on for years. This is, of course, Temp Aesthetic. Harvest Dental product, you all know it. Very beautiful and very strong. And that's been kind of my go-to material for years when I'm working on these provisionals. Again, with the provisionals, I don't believe in the myth that if you make them too pretty, the patient will never come back. That is absolutely not true. I make them as beautiful and as aesthetic as I possibly can because it creates excitement for the patient. And I'm gonna show you what that looks like. This is gonna, the mill, of course, gets you 90% there. We're gonna go ahead and add our finishing touches to it. This is the same way that I finished zirconia when we were talking about that yesterday. Nothing changes. The material is just different. And you see some of the translucency that you can get with, with that. And you can give that to the patient. We charge a nominal fee. I think it's maybe 450 bucks for those provisionals. Because at this point, with prototyping, you could print it. And we'll give that to them for free. Because that's going to go ahead and be our prototype. Or you can give them the long-term aesthetic provisional. And that's, there's the keep after we're all done. When we're all done with the case here. That's yours. Give it to the patient. They could take it home with them. They could save it. Let's see if we're, we're going to get this to go ahead and roll, see if the, the video will play for us. Can you get um, uh, some sound for us? This is, this is really nice. And this is what I'm talking about, the value of a really aesthetic provisional. Oh, is it me? I don't have my glasses on. Well, what that is, is that's Brenda. And Brenda had a really about a three-year hard road with her case. She was losing implants. They were placing implants. Did we get her? I'll narrate. So she's crying. And she says, um, <laughs> <laughs> it's live this, we do it again. I even cut behind. And she says, and these are only the temporaries. And that's the argument we've always had. We hear the guys say, well, make the temps ugly, and then they'll come back. No, make them spectacular and give some confidence to the patient. Yep. She said, I actually said, Jack, are you insane? We spoke about this case last year. I said, you did this in the temporary phase and we got to replicate that in zirconia? And he's like, yeah, I got this. But that really gives us the ability to give her something that she can say, yeah, I like it or I don't. Yeah. And you can see Jack made some rotations on the bottom, so now it's a true reflection of what we're gonna give her. Yeah, and that's, and that's really what she wanted. I directed kind of the aesthetics from the very beginning with the provisional. At this point, she wanted some rotations. She wanted to look natural, and I was able to deliver that to her. Um, and, and you know, it's, it's really, at this point, it's, she's gained, I mean, that's a double jaw case. In all honesty, in case you don't know, that's fifty thousand dollars. Okay, that's that's you can run that as kind of like a, that's where an industry standard where it's at. It's fifty grand. Think of the last time you bought something for fifty thousand dollars that didn't look good, right? If I'm spending fifty thousand dollars, it better be hot. And then they put it in the mouth, and she's gonna look at the doctor and say, "Oh, I can't wait to get the finals." And then he's gonna look like a hero. And then they may or may not know who you are, but then you're gonna look like a hero to him. And it's kind of that trickle down effect. Now here's our other patient, and this is a prototype. And now we're going ahead and we're gathering information. Now what do you notice? Right there, her buccal corridors are, are kind of deficient, okay? Or they're, they're kind of collapsed. We're noticing that in that short little clip that the doctor sent to me. We're gonna go ahead and make sure that we pick that up. You see here? And we're gonna talk about how the doctor then 
added some composite. That's all it took to go ahead and show me how much was needed to fill in the corridor so that I can come back and do another printed prototype. Prototyping is the most valuable thing that we've had. Um, and I think it's often, it's not given enough credit for what it is. I'll go ahead and fill it in. There we go. So what we'll do with that is we'll scan it back into the computer software. It's a three shape. They will go ahead and adjust the design. I am on the original design file. The reason why is that has to carry through all of the try-ins. And each time, I'll do a modified pre-op scan. When you start completely redesigning it, that's when all hell is going to break loose on you. We'll look at a little bit of, of, about design. Dries actually is here, and, and Maya, they're the, the experts at the Absolutes, in Absolutes CAD CAM department. Any changes, bring out the buckle corridor. We'll go ahead and add our tissue. The reason why the tissue application now is so important when we're dealing with these cases is because if we're looking at a product like Mio, we need that as a support base. We're not cutting it all back. Patient approval and sign off, very, very important. We do not, do not move forward and hit go on a zirconia arch until that patient has said 100%, this is what I want. Because I guarantee, as soon as you mill that case and you put it in the mouth, you're coming right back and redoing it. So they have to, they have to approve it. The doctor has to approve it. And then it's your job to give them that exactly back. So we have the shades and they talk about she wants to be one and we're gonna kind of get into that a little bit. There's the kind of, you know, RX. And this is oh. my slide, I'm gonna jump in here. Oh, Jack does not know about you. this slide. So every time we speak together, which is you know, nice. twice a year, I like to surprise him with a little Jack moment. <coughs> How's that look? So, so as you know Jack, the Jack everybody knows and loves on stage, very professional and you know, always entertaining. There's a different Jack that I know. So there's one thing about me. If you share something I can use against you, I will always hey, use it against you. The flavor saver was in style back then. I don't care what you say. And you will notice that uh, even in his model days, he was also balding, which he has never admitted to. It's so he shares this with there. me. And I, I actually thought he was kidding, but he was an actual Calvin Klein underwear model. That's La Tigre. That's blue so steel. Uh, I said, wow, Jack, you're an impressive guy. You got a big <laughs> resume. So when Jack gets ready for Chicago, he actually does face masks. Look, now, I'm going to, so I have no idea these are up here, and it's absolutely ridiculous and absurd that you did that. And I'll get you back later. But my wife is here, and then I have, I have three daughters, and they're always doing this masking thing, and the manis, and the petties, and the eye creams, and the. So, you know, I'm like, hey, well, I got to kind of fix myself up for all you guys because I didn't want to look like, you know, I've been sleeping in the lab and show up here looking like hell. So I'm like, I'll try it. Yeah, Dad, let's put one of these masks on you. I'm like, all right, I'll try it. They put so, it on me. Have you ever had one of those? They're amazing. It feels so good. And it gives us amazing things to use against you off stage. <laughs> it's a win-win for us all. So Drew and myself went to Vegas a few weeks ago and the team just absolutely harassed him. So we're not even at the airport yet and we get a text from Jack, help me, take me with you. <laughs> They're killing me in the lab. He we said, well, see you in two days, buddy. So a nice fun fact about Jack is he's a Marine. And very early on he told Jeff, there's no such thing as an ex-Marine. You never say ex-Marine, it's a Marine till the day you die. And thank you for your service, and I mean that. <laughs> so, uh, <clears throat> it was in Korea somewhere, and they've been drinking, and they get hit by lightning in a small plane and almost die in the process. So he got a little nervous in flying. So the first time I met him, he said, I'm a very nervous flyer. I'm like, what do you mean nervous? It's a big plane. What can go wrong? I said, if it crashes, you're dead anyway. You just don't worry about it. Because if you <laughs> ever so thought, bad. Don't fly with him because he will just... Have you ever thought that the guy who has to change the fuel pump might be having a bad day and he forgets to put a screw in? I'm like, I didn't even think an airplane had a fuel pump, Jack. Don't think about <laughs> these things. So he gets some medical help and uh, the doctor goes, you're the perfect case for Xanax. Calms you out, 
deletes the short-term memory, so all scary things on the plane you will forget about, and he gives him some Xanax. So now he is anal retentive, because the guy said, you can stop breathing if you take too much of this. So he has four tablets, time stamped, two o'clock, three o'clock, five o'clock. What he added was one beer, two beers, beer on the aeroplane, and then beer when I wake up. So as the prescription said, do not take with alcohol, our friend kind of does this. And he flies very comfortably. Never stop breathing next to me. And, you know, <laughs> what I did notice was that's five minutes after we get on the plane. <laughs> so if we're going to San Diego, it's pretty easy. You know, We got eight hours. And he re-ups. And then it's one and a half beer when you re-up because you can't overindulge because you'll stop breathing. So one day we fly to DC. And DC from North Carolina is literally a 40 mile. I mean, the plane just goes like this. I'm like, Jack. You can't take Xanax. We're speaking at Bethesda. That night we have dinner with the colonel and some general. And I don't know what. He's like, I got this. Don't worry about it. So we get there. I said, Jack. He said, hey, Jack goes, I can drive. Because the thing with Xanax I've noticed is you come out of it like that. But you think you're out of it. So he's like, I can drive. Not a problem. That's in the car on the way to the general's <laughs> house to go and talk about this. And I will give him this. When he got out of that car, he was stone cold sober <laughs> and very professional. So if anybody wants to travel with Jack, you know, let him know he's got a good prescription system. Nobody's ever stopped breathing. I wouldn't pretend it. But you know, some respect to Jack. You know, he's truly, you can ask my business partner. He said to me the other day, this guy is a true artist. I don't think any of us in the lab has ever seen a guy that can green state finish like he does. And he taught us, you do not cut zirconia after it's scented. And that is so important. I don't think I've ever seen a high-end technician that willing to share. If you ever want to come to the lab, this guy will make it worth your time. We had two Canadian ladies in the lab last week. Mm. And the Monday I called the lab owner, I said, was it worth it? He said, they picked up Mio in a day. And we could not figure out how to do this. So I encourage you, if he ever does hands-on, he shares everything he knows. So he came up with this idea to start the Absolute Academy. It's really, you know, education is very close to my heart. Last year, I got away from it. Um, last year, if you're one of the ones that contact me, say, hey, Jack, let's hang out. Let's geek out and do a, do a case together. I am so sorry. Um, it was a crazy building year for us last year. Uh, but this year, we are going to open an established Absolute Academy. We already have three course dates on the books right now. Uh, they'll be advertised. If you follow us on social media, you guys will be able to see it. Um, that in our travels all over the place and what we're up to next. And what we want to do with this, if I can interrupt, is also get our corporate sponsors involved. Not just do this on Mio, or not just do it on Zirconia, but talk about CONUS, talk mm. about guided surgery. So if there's anything your team, and I'm not saying we know everything, but why we love doing this is we learn from you just as much as you're going to learn from us. And we're our own best resource. Exactly. We really, we really, really are. So we have our contact information on the back. And if you, if you ever have a question, send it our way. We'll talk about it. If you have somebody, especially Mio, Mio on Zirconia is a must. We had Mio. <clears throat> we bought it. We threw it away. It's the biggest garbage I've ever seen. Dries was like, this is ridiculous. Jack walked in and said, where's the Mio kit? And we couldn't believe what he did with it. Half the time, no layering porcelain. No. No thickness. So that's just one of the products that I really think, you know, this is a huge no resource. No layering powder porcelain. So here's the slide where Jack gets in trouble with the guys next door. <laughs> Wait, I, I need the clicker back. I'll give you so, the clicker. So again, I we're talking to do about this. zirconia. I'm going to get off the this stage. This has been a whole theme this week for me since uh, Monday at UIC and then Wednesday at the ACP. Um, advancements in materials and advancements in techniques that we're seeing, and we're seeing them at an accelerated, rapid pace. So right now we're talking about the HTML. And the reason why we're talking about the HTML, and it's already been a year since this product was released by the other guys, um, is because this product, I feel, my opinion, everybody has one, I like mine personally, yeah, so, <laughs> is um, it, this is for me? It's it's not acceptable for the work that I do. Um, you're going to have a very very opaque 
base layer. You're going to have a very, very strange translucency, very weak area on top. And then you're going to have a line. Um, that line, when we work in full arch, because the transition is not soft and because the jump is so hard, um, is very, very evident. And when you come to nesting these restorations, it is very, very difficult to keep it like this on the level. So what you end up with straight away, and we've known this for years because I've been working and developing multi-layer products like PMMAs with Harvest Dental, that if it's any which way like this, and it is not a soft transition, you're going like this from six and down here to 11. Now, the, the answer to that or the solution is let's layer it. That to me is not a solution. We've now gone five, six years back. I don't want to layer it. Not with the quality of zirconia and, and, and the formulations that people like Jeff and Paul are able to create. It doesn't make sense. So for me, that was not uh, that was not a solution, not an answer, and, and we, we don't use it. If we look right here, this is going to be just the black, uh, back of two blocks, and if you come to the laboratory, you'll see I have zirconia cut everywhere. Dries is right here. He sits next to me in the laboratory, and there's zirconia, this zirconia cut, that zirconia cut. It's all for testing and checking it out. And the best way to test and check it out is cut it and sinter it. Um, to the right, obviously, we could see that line, and to the left, you can see, and it's, it's hard with the projection, but that's gonna be the HTML uh, very early on stage, and you can see that soft, I use the word soft transition, it's not harsh, it's not hard, and that really, once they're done with it, um, I believe is gonna be a fantastic hybrid zirconia. And it's gonna give me the same strength from the bottom to the top. It's gonna to give me that four Y zirconia from the bottom to top. I get lots of calls of, and, and friends of mine in, in prosthodontics and you know, the first thing they say is, you know, have you heard about this? And yes, I have heard about it. What do you think about it? And then I start getting into the nitty gritty and the details and I'm like, oh yeah. And then we top it off in that five Y zirconia. Now five Y zirconia in part, not to defend it, has got almost kind of a bad rap. And it was because of early on um, versions that were incredibly weak and incredibly brittle. I mean, they were just bad. You couldn't even process them in the laboratory without them breaking. And the shades were really weird and crazy. If you look at something like the STML, that would be categorized, and Paul's probably more the expert than I am, but that would be categorized probably in a 5Y category, but it's so close to a 4Y in strength and characteristics, okay? The problem with it is if I have to nose down that arch like this during nesting, I'm popping up my distal occlusion, right? And now where am I sitting? That's not good. Because guys, I don't want you getting these cases back. I restore a zirconia hybrid, it goes in the mouth and it stays in the mouth, period. It is not coming back. I have very rarely seen catastrophic failure because I'm very cautious in what I'm using. 1250 MPA. The same thing, we went over this yesterday in the green stage finishing, been using the same burrs forever, the same um, rubber wheels and the same cutting discs, and I use it on all the materials and we talked about that. That hasn't changed in forever, and it's kind of funny, I joke with everybody because I made that slide about nine years ago, um, and I still keep using it today because nothing's changed. I use the same ones. The only thing that's different is I use, there is a round end taper, that this exact carbide that is not shown uh, but it's a round end taper. I think it's the H293E from Brassler that I use more than I actually use the just round. I use the taper, it's nice. Uh, we'll go through these fairly quickly. Of course, pre uh, center finishing. If you're doing occlusion, and all I do is just accentuate basically the central faucet. If you spend more than two seconds there, get out. You're spending too much time, you're playing. There's a zip, and you're in and out. And then this is where the artistry takes place. Um, that's where we are. We're not going around and changing anything. We're just adding our surface texture and anatomy. Short stiff. I always talk about short stiff, and I use short stiff because if you don't, it's going to feel like you just got a haircut, and I don't like that sensation. It freaks me out. And speed polish, Harvest Dental speed polish. Again, if a lot of you guys were by the Harvest Dental booth, this polish and, and has been remarkable. I was talking to somebody earlier about the previous polishes and you couldn't get them off. They were terrible to get off. I actually take the restorations because I don't use a steamer on them. I put them in ammonia and that was the best way to get them off. One minute ammonia and boom, the green one and the gray one, they were clean, they were off. Um, the speed polish is water soluble. 
So now I don't have to steam my zirconia, which I would never do, and I'm not dunking in ammonia, which is nice. Uh, so just some warm water, it comes right off and it polishes very, very quickly. And here we go, we're gonna kind of go through this case and I got to hustle. Um, green stage finish, and this is basically what we talked about yesterday. I'm gonna go ahead and do my cuts in sisal and gingival embrasures. We'll go ahead and, and contour, we'll do our surface texture and anatomy. And that's mine, that's kind of my look and I made this case and, and everybody's will look different but everybody's will be exceptional if you keep in these kind of key areas, incisal embrasures, gingival embrasures and then, then, it's, then it's your own. But really, really do that guys because it kicks it up a couple notches um, and this is what it looks like you know, when, when I'm doing it on the bench top, on the camera it's a little difficult and tricky sometimes. There we go. And you can see right here, I even have some cool um, tertiary stippling. Very cool. More to come. And there you go. No, final image. Um, How long did it take you to get to that from the original? Okay, so don't judge it from me, but it'll take me 30, 40 minutes, right? That's pretty rough. Yeah. That's, that's, it starts off pretty rough. And every mill, so all mills mill good. Just some mills need a little bit more work than others. But I think, you know, they're all basically kind of in the ballpark. Um, it'll take you a little bit more to clean one up than the other. But that's totally okay. Again, you get a little bit of curtaining sometimes with the tissue. Uh, you know, if, if, I don't expect everybody to be as quick or as fast as me, and that's totally okay. Um, again, I've been cutting this stuff for, ever. So I kind of, and you know, as you've seen the way I work, it's, it's very quick and very efficient. We're going to go ahead and center it. We can already see that layer that Jeff and uh, Paul are working on right now. Can everybody see it just from where you're sitting? It's, it's not um, fake, weird, banded, harsh transitioning. Um, it's very soft and it looks very, very good. And again, they're still modifying this to get the exact perfect formula to create that perfect layered and size of edge. This case is B1, um, kind of difficult to really, really get it to stand out. Kind of walk through these. Mio, Mio structure. And our final restoration. This is kind of where we were. This is where we went to. Now, that case being B1 um, and very light is very difficult, especially the lighter shades to see the transitions in the, the multi-layer. But we got this other case. This is Dr. James Pizzo at UIC. I've been showing this all week because he literally just delivered this case on Wednesday. And I was super excited. He's an outstanding. Uh, young prosthodontist. There's his provisionals. Here's our zirconia. You guys have been seeing this image um, all week now. And there it is, centered. With this darker shade, this is, I believe this is A2 we used, Jeff. Um, you could see that incisal edge that's been placed in there a lot easier than you could with the B1, because the B1 kind of just washes out, right? Ugh. One. And then, you know, you're, we, I have been getting them, at least where the patients don't want no color. They just want centered zirconia, which is kind of scary. There it is, finished. Here we go to the mouth. And he looks very, very happy. And, and really, guys, where we're at, you can't get much better than that. How are we doing on time? A few minutes. All right, he looks really, really happy. That case came out really, really nice. And that's where we're going with this, guys. We're kind of driving it towards that still monolithic solution, but getting the max aesthetics out of it. So that's me on the way back to the doctor because I just bit my veneer in half. And I thought there's quite a difference between me and the JDT and me on the way back to the dentist. And what I found was, you know how nerve wracking it is to be a patient for a change? especially knowing what we're knowing, and I'm thinking short margin, I'm gonna lose tissue with the interproximal open contact. You sound like me flying. Truth. Exactly <laughs> like you flying. <laughs> Difference is I don't take Xanax, I just let Dries do the crown, so I don't have to worry about it. 
And I thought to myself, you know, we're so honored to, is it good, do you think? So honored to do what we're doing. And um, I'm a cancer survivor, 12 years. And uh, after this process we went through, we kind of reevaluated life a little bit. We're like, ugh, I might not make it. I was 38 years old. And that's kind of a shocking day to get something like that. So we started a care foundation. Oh, let's just hit it. So we started a care foundation and we started giving back. And this is one of the testimonies that one of our patients shot about what we did. Three years ago, I was involved in a greasy road accident that almost claimed my life. I lost hope. I experienced pain indescribable. I wondered if I would ever be able to smile again, speak in public, or even see. To cut the long story short, I decided that I was going to smile from my heart because beauty is skin deep. One beautiful morning, I dropped off the kids at school and felt the need to go to Walmart. As soon as I got out of the car and noticed a piece of metal and I picked it up, and then realized there were actually wedding rings, an engagement ring and a wedding band. Little did I know that that was going to be the beginning of a new smile. After about a week, by this time, all of the rooms had found their rightful owner. I got a call from ABC 11 News asking if I could come forward and meet with someone that wanted to just say thank you to me. So as soon as I pulled into the parking lot and I saw the name Absolute Dental Services, I said, could it be what it seems like? I met Trace and Connor and they explained to me how they were going to bless me with a brand new smile because of what I had done with the rings. I was so humbled and I said to myself, wow, Conrad, Grace, told me how they saw my story on the news and they knew that I was hiding with my hand a beautiful smile and having a dress saying that they were going to give me a smile that would be as good as it was before. And that little voice in my head said, how is that going to be? I couldn't stop crying. I was so excited. I was overjoyed. As soon as that conversation was done, I went home and uh, they started the appointments and I met with uh, Dr. Mitch of dentistry at the park, many appointments here and there, and eventually I got my brand new smile. I love my smile. And it's amazing just what this one single act has done to me. It has boosted my confidence. I am able to smile, I'm able to speak without worrying that people are judging me or they are, they are getting glued to my smile, but instead they can focus on what I'm saying. It has changed my perspective. I want to go out and I want to help people discover their purpose and reach their potential. That is my way of giving back to the community in my way of saying thank you. So as you can imagine, um, I'm not legally allowed to prep teeth in the US. I did stay at a Holiday Inn at some point, but that didn't help either. So after we found this patient, and literally we were laying in bed one Saturday morning, and I saw her, and she was speaking behind her hand, and she dropped her hand, and I was like, wow. Stunningly beautiful woman with this torn up smile. So the next week, uh, I called ABC. I said, we'd like to do this through our charitable, but I needed a dentist. So I started calling all my customers, and they also saw this story on TV, and nobody answered the phone for a week and a half. <laughs> and I say that tongue in cheek, we got, we got these guys to all chip in their time, and it was an extremely difficult case. She had a central, the only healthy tooth, right in the midline. So the only one we couldn't extract was the one day, always how it is. The only implants who don't fail are the ones you want to have fail. So we went through the process and we put temporaries in and it was awful. And you probably noticed it's not a perfect case, not by a long shot. But Dries did a great job on the case. She cried for half an hour. We couldn't get her to stop crying. Whew. <laughs> that was a big day. So I thought to myself, you know, what we do is such a blessing 
we don't always realize, you know, sitting in a lab with 100 case spans, it's just another case span, but that's the results. Then it's so important what we do, and I'm so glad, and I, I thank you for being able to share that with you. So I'd like to end today recognizing our absolute team, <coughs> a bunch of crazy guys. <laughs> I still don't know who that is. We're going to find out. <coughs> and, uh, you know, yeah, we'll leave it at that. But without Megan Reed and Trisha Kimball, it's my assistant and our, our head of digital, they worked till 12 o'clock last night in the snow in North Carolina. It's the first time I ever come to Chicago where it's snowing in North Carolina and it's 30 degrees in Chicago. Brought all my clothes, but thank you to them for making Jack's dream come true of a yeah. 3D presentation. Sure Probably did. not exactly how we envisioned it. I kind of injected a little bit there, <laughs> so I apologize. And then I really need to say thank you to Arjun. So I'm going to tell you a little bit of a story with Jack. Jack joined us two years ago. And Jack's original association was obviously heavily invested with Emacs and the launch of that product. And we were looking for a partner. So we, we went to different companies and we looked for people that we can represent. And uh, I've known Stefani for 20 years. So she calls me, she said, before you guys make a decision where you want to go, fly to San Diego, come and meet the team. So we went there, I met Anton and Michael and Jeff and the team and everybody else. <clears throat> we thought, nice guys. So on the way back, Jack and I had a discussion that he can't remember, because <laughs> he was high. So I made some notes and recorded most of it. And uh, he said, man, this really, they gave us a tour of how they make the zirconia. We spoke to Paul Cascone and Jeff and everybody else. And uh, we, were, we were kind of torn, who do we go with? You know, because you go with one of the big names, they're going to drive you to the top pretty quickly. And I called Stefani the money. I said, what do you think? As a friend, what do you think? She said, if I can tell you one thing about Anton Wolf, if he tells you he'll do it, he will always do it. And that made us decide to go with these guys. And I can tell you, you probably agree with this, a super superb company to mm. work with. We do a lot of R&D with them now. So yeah, we're a little biased. We love the products, but you can see what Jack's able to do with it. <clears throat> and we'll never speak on a product that we don't believe in. That's true. But we got to give this company some kudos. It's I've known Jeff for years. I mean, there's, there's, they're really top shelf straight across the board. I so mean, nobody a, cares more. It's a, it's a family owned business. Mm. And uh, fellow South Africans, so you know, we were a little biased there. But I got to say a special thank you to Lori, Monica, Gabriel, they worked so hard. And when they asked me, can we get the video three days ago and we had about six seconds worth of footage, I was like, yes, we will have a video, but it won't be today. <laughs> so they tested last night, and I really thank you guys for bearing with us and making this possible. And mm -hmm. I hope uh, everybody enjoyed it. Um, we try to make it a little more fun, a little bit more out of the box. And if you have any questions, yeah, I'm Conrad at Absolute Dental, he's Jack at Absolute Dental. <clears throat> Please feel free, reach out to Jack, reach out to myself, and uh, we, we, we gladly help where we can. So, a little ahead of time, which is good. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Thank you.